Doggy You, and today I'm here with Megan and Archie, her service dog, and we're going to be talking all about migraine alert and response dogs. Now this is a really cool team because I've been working with them for a while, and I help them with their public access and their test training, but not the scent portion of it. So the scent stuff is not something that is my forte, though I'm going to be taking some courses on it this year, but Megan spent a lot of time learning how to train a migraine alert with her dog Archie, and we're going to talk all about that today. So Megan, what made you want to train a migraine alert and response dog? So initially I only wanted to train a response dog and um, it was actually recommended to me by my neurologist. So I went in and at the time my migraines had gotten so severe that they were really affecting my quality of life. They did a disability assessment and it came back that at the time I was severely disabled. And the doctor had said that I was sort of at the end of my options for trying new medications and then it was sort of, you know, how can we moderate your lifestyle and how can we find some things to help. So a response dog was the goal, something that could bring me my medications, turn lights off, I lived alone at the time, and um, I didn't expect Archie to be able to alert. I wasn't super confident in how well we knew that was going to work, so I kind of shied away from it initially and we ended up just sort of falling into it once I got a little bit more information. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's great that there was another option outside yeah. of medication once you'd exhausted all of those other options with your doctor. Right, yeah, truly. So now you're a doctor and you have decided that going towards a service dog might be another way to help you with your disability. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about Archie and how you got, a, got him and all of that. So I did a lot of research up front on what kind of breeds would be the right fit for me. So Archie's a golden retriever, he's about two years old now, and I got him from a breeder that has a long history of placing service dog prospects. Um, and I, I found her through a uh, sort of one of those clubs um, that certify like certain types of breeders as being you know uh, great health tested dogs great temperament tested dogs and things like that um, I also did speak to there was another service dog trainer who didn't have capacity but was able to advise me on how to find the right prospect so I kind of took in all of that advice and this was before we knew each other and I was able to then say like six nine months in advance at least know what I needed mm -hmm. and that was great because to be honest if I hadn't had those conversations I don't think I would make the right choice there were a lot of breeds I really liked but maybe Maybe weren't so well suited. When did you start training with him? Uh, honestly, day one, yeah. like right at eight weeks. Like obviously, I was not training retrievals at eight weeks old, but the socialization right out the gate and everything like that. I mean, um, I, he was like twelve weeks old, and I'm like very quietly playing like firework sounds while he's eating his food. It was comical, honestly, but it was constant. So as far as a migraine alert and response dog, what does that type of service dog actually do? So for me, Archie will alert me by moving my leg when um, I'm about to get a migraine. And so at that point, I can now like take my medication, uh, I have rescue treatments available. And then if I'm bad enough that I'm unable to do anything else, I get ocular migraines, so I do lose my vision completely with them, everything but my peripheral. Um, so he can do things like turn the lights off, which I'm very sensitive to, fetch me medication if I need that. Um, and one of the things that I've always had a problem with is not only is it very difficult for me to see, I get very dizzy, which which is a very disorienting feeling so even though I can feel my way around my house it feels like I'm going to fall when sometimes I'm not so Archie stands between my legs when I'm standing still like if I need to get a glass of water and it just helps me understand that I'm not moving when I feel like I am yeah so um, centering you yeah he just centers me yeah. it's like a very nice like grounding kind of task that he does for me that's awesome yeah it's really cool So we had a Patreon question from someone in the Doggy You community about alert behaviors and how you chose that alert behavior. You said he boops your leg when that happens. Yes. How did you decide to use that as your alert? So I wanted something where he could do it in a confined space. Obviously, I, I travel a lot. I travel a lot for work. This is something you know really well. And so I need him to be sometimes under a desk, on a plane, on a train, and I need him to be able to do it in a confined space. So it couldn't be like a big do a loop-de-loop -loop kind of thing. I didn't want it to be loud or disruptive, like no barking, no jumping nothing like that um, so a boop was kind of the perfect fit the only other thing I considered was a chin rest onto mm -hmm. like my leg or any other part of my body the reason we didn't do the chin rest was as it turns out Archie loves to drool um, and it was just getting all over my clothes so the boop <laughs> was the the perfect one for me and we um, but based on your advice went with always doing the same leg that way I knew and the only um, kind of alternative alert we have is if I'm in the car it's my right shoulder 
Okay, awesome. Um, and how long did it t take to teach the booping portion? Because I know we did that together. I think yeah. it took a couple months. To it did. Yeah. yeah, that actually took a while to get him always going to the same spot. And the biggest problem I had was um, pressure. Mm -hmm. he, he really struggled with doing it hard enough that it was distinct. Because yeah. he kind of lightly would brush uh, over time, it, it gets yeah. weaker. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that took months. Yeah, and, and that's the thing to think about when you're talking about service dogs and picking a behavior that you're going to use for an alert is like doing what's best for the dog. So chin rest wasn't going to work because it was going to get your clothes dirty. Same yeah. thing, I have people who want to do like pawing a lot of the yeah. time. And if you've got a dog and you're out in public and it's raining and your dog's just pawing your clothing, it's not doesn't make a lot of sense because it's going to make it a little bit difficult and you're going to get mud all over yourself. Exactly. <laughs> Which nobody likes. Yeah. So yeah, the strengthening the boop can take a while for dogs that aren't naturally push that push into pressure. Yeah. yeah. Hey friends, quick pause here so you have time to boop that like button. Jake, Whip, and I would be so grateful. And if you're liking this type of video, I would love it if you'd consider subscribing to the channel. When I get new subscribers, it lets me know that I'm putting out the type of content that people are looking for. And that's what I'm trying to do here. So if you have videos that you'd like to see, make sure you put them down in the comments below so I know the types of things you'd like me to create. All right, let's get back to it. So how much time in advance of a migraine does he tend to alert and how has that affected your life? He usually alerts about 30 minutes before, which is uh, 30 minutes before I feel any symptoms, um, and sometimes as little as five minutes. Uh, critically for me, it's enough time to get off the road. As I mentioned before, I do get ocular migraines, I lose my vision. Before I had RT, I actually couldn't drive, I didn't have a license. And, and that so, was for like a year, right? That you weren't able to I was only able to drive for seven years. Wow, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, I got my license, you know, young, and, um, and very quickly found that it just wasn't a, a safe option for me or other drivers on the road and that was just a decision I came to with my doctor at the time and when I had Archie and was now seeing that I had a warning mm -hmm. uh, I discussed that with my neurologist and they felt confident that that was plenty of time for me to get off the road and it has been uh, which is great yeah so ocular migraines what does that look like and how often are we talking that you're getting this kind of mm -hmm. migraine like is this from a person who's getting you know like myself who gets migraines occasionally once or twice a month or what were you experiencing so for me personally I everybody who gets migraines will experience something kind of different but the visual disturbances for me me are that I lose almost entirely all of my vision. I'm, I'm unable to read, I can't see my phone, I can't use my phone, let alone see a road. Um, and for me, my migraines had gotten so severe that I was averaging four to five days a week. Wow. So I was experiencing them more days than I was not. I really didn't have a lot of independence and they could last anywhere from two hours to three days for me. So at the time that I had done that dis a disability assessment with my doctor, it really came back as very severe. Yeah, and that was your first step, right? Is that yeah. you did a disability assessment to, yes. to see if it was going to be a good fit Yeah, for you. it's called a MIDAS. It's, it's specifically a migraine disability assessment. And if you uh, actively get chronic migraines and you have a neurologist, it's something they can do with you. So we had another Patreon question that was about, you know, how you actually got the dog to learn how to do these alerts, because originally it wasn't something that you were planning on doing and you weren't confident that you could make it happen because the science just isn't there yet as far as what the specific chemical is that they're alerting to, just that they can and that some will pick it up without training and then some require training for it. Um, the whole process for that, we're actually going to go do over on the doggy Patreon page uh, because it's going to be a pretty long video if we include it here. So if that interests you, um, you can check it out. I will put a link down in the description, but it's patreon.com slash doggyu. So we'll continue this discussion about the specific steps that Megan used um, over on there. But once you started training for the alert, how long did it take for him to actually do live alerts for you? Like independently, probably three months before he started actually coming up to me and alerting. And initially, so quick. it was really quick. Yeah. I was honestly shocked. I think getting getting the sense was far more time consuming than getting him to start alerting. Um, but initially, do you want to tell us like a little bit about getting the sense? It's, it involves a lot of saliva. <laughs> it's very tedious. Um, so generally speaking, what you want to do is just capture a scent from before you're sick, which means, you know, you can't predict the future. So you have to do it all of the time. Like or every hour? Every hour yeah. for weeks. And it was exhausting. I had lots of jars and everything has to be so sterile and separated because it's a very careful scientific process. Um, so my apartment and refrigerator were just full of jars <laughs> of my scent. Um, and it's gross when you really break it down like that. And it's so, not cotton, right? It's on cotton balls. Yeah. That, that, like, that was the thing why I don't do scent work is because like I have this little weirdsy about like cotton balls that like 
I don't know. I just can't do it. I was afraid to have people open my fridge. I was like, nobody should see what's in here right now. It was like really embarrassing. <laughs> Not embarrassing. We're <laughs> getting a medical thing, but sure. yeah. So like that, but that sounds like a lot of work. It, it was a not lot of work. an easy process. It, it was disruptive to a lot of my life too, because yeah. like even though I worked from home and I was able to do it, I tend to have meetings back to back, so I'd have like a short like sixty second break, and I'm running off to like swab the inside of my cheeks. It was a lot. It was yeah. really a lot, and it yeah. went on for a long time. That's yeah, that's intense. Yeah. <laughs> So we were talking a lot about the alert process, mm -hmm. but that isn't necessarily something that every dog is going to be able to do. So the thing about doing like an alert or response dog is that not every dog will be able to alert, but every dog will be able to learn how to do the tasks, or most dogs will be able to learn how to do the tasks that are a response to your medical condition. Right. So what types of stuff did you teach him or do you still use mm -hmm. um, that you know you use when you have a migraine? So uh, one of the big things was turning the lights off for being yeah. very light sensitive and getting to a light switch is impossible. Um, so that's something he, he did and continues to do. Another one that he was doing for a while is he would fetch my medications for me and bring them. The only thing with that is uh, since that point, I've switched all my medications over to injections and I just am not comfortable, even if they're in a sealed case, having him carry them. It's just sort of a safety concern for me. Mm -hmm. um, the good news was because Archie's been alerting to me, I can now take my medications so much earlier that I'm still capable of getting them myself at the point that I'm going to take them so that's been a huge change um, and then another thing he's been doing is sort of that like centering type mm. thing when I'm dizzy yeah uh, we talked about doing some light guide work just because I can't see and it ended up just being that frankly my apartment was so small that I know my way around and he just kind of follows me so yeah and I know originally we had also talked a little bit about um, doing like some type of guiding to the bathroom because you weren't able to get to the bathroom on your own. Yeah. It, it didn't end up being something that you needed, but it didn't. There, no. There's lots of things that your dog can do to respond to a medical condition. Um, you know, bringing you a sleeping mask. Uh, you know, being able to guide you to certain locations if you are no longer able to see. Um, providing balance and support when you're getting up from mm -hmm. something, if you're yeah. not able like, to transfer off the toilet, that yeah. kind of thing. Something so, I've had him do too that the, we didn't specifically mean to train was uh, if you drop something with a migraine, if you get migraines, mm -hmm. you know you do not want to bend over. Um, and he's great about picking them up for me, so yeah. that's been really nice as well. But it wasn't really a task I meant to train. Yeah. It just kind of happened. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah. There's so much that you can do. And like once you start training your service dog to do a thing, mm -hmm. like you're like, oh, it would also be helpful if they did this. Yeah, oh, so it would also be builds. helpful. Yeah. <laughs> and you got the right breed for the task that you we're looking for you got a large dog he's about 90 pounds is that right he's 80 80 yeah. pounds yeah. yeah and also a retriever so yes. much easier to teach a retrieve to that type of dog than a dog that doesn't have a natural retrieve exactly yeah, yeah. So we've talked about it a little bit, but what benefits have you found now having a service dog to help manage or mitigate portions of your disability? I mean, being able to drive was obviously the big one for me. That was the biggest life changer. But I do think that like feeling of, if you have a chronic illness that's unpredictable, you're often living in fear of becoming sick when you're traveling or you're at work. And those things were really difficult for me. For a long time, I was always worried it would happen at the wrong time and it often did. Um, and now knowing that I get a warning, I often have a chance to actually get myself all the way home before I'm sick, which has wow. been life changing. I've gotten stuck at work before where like I end up, you know, a lot like a lot of offices have sort of a quiet room you can go to um, if you're not feeling well. And I would kind of go there and not be able to leave because I can't get on the train. I couldn't get an Uber. And then it's sort of really you're stuck. difficult you're and stuck. you'd much rather just like be in the comfort of your own home when you're experiencing like very painful illness exactly yeah. it is so painful and so debilitating and just knowing that i get a warning and usually it's enough warning to get myself home from where i am i'm yeah. often within 30 minutes of my house yeah. um that's been amazing for yeah. me and traveling, I know that you work remotely, but you, yes. you, I remember we were like preparing for your first trip somewhere and yeah. you were able to bring Archie and it all went off without a hitch. It did. It, it went shockingly smooth for his first <laughs> flight. So um, I, I work primarily remote, but I do travel for work as well. Mm -hmm. And I go um, up to our headquarter office from time to time. So sometimes I'm flying, sometimes it's a train. Um, but the first flight, I remember kind of prepping with you, going yeah. through that whole training session. And uh, there were a couple things I didn't expect, like uh, TSA asked me to take all of his gear off um so he was completely naked no collar nothing oh my gosh i kind of remember <laughs> this right did like a kid run up to him or something yes oh it was gosh. like a toddler ran up in the i swear the parent just like sent the child over and I was like, oh my gosh. 
So they sent me through one scanner and they wanted him to go through a different one. So I was already through, he was on the other side in, um, in just like a sit stay. No gear on. I had no leash. They were all like in first the scanner. Time, first time going to first TSA. Time flying. And like TSA is a stressful event for yeah. me. Like let alone yes. a dog. Oh my gosh. Um, and th thankfully he was an angel about it. But a uh, toddler ran up and grabbed his face like right on the muzzle. Oh my gosh. Um, and I just kind of gave him like a stay, wait, mm -hmm. and he didn't move, didn't react, and I just kind of yelled to the parent, said I need you to please take your child away from my dog. He's working. Um, and thankfully they did quite quickly but um, we got through TSA without a hitch, he didn't move, and even the whole flight, he just slept, so. That's amazing. <laughs> that was yeah. amazing. And, and that's what I always tell people is like, the reason you need a bomb-proof style <laughs> dog is that stuff that's weird is going to happen all the time. Like, Constantly. all the time, mm -hmm. you'll be like, oh, did that store employee just bark at my dog? <laughs> yeah, they did. Um, and that's the type of stuff that really does happen. So they like, do, yeah. having a child run up, I mean, that happens quite frequently. So we talked about your airport incident. Have you run into any other public access issues with Archie? I sure have. Yeah. yeah. So um, on occasion, I've kind of gone to go into a restaurant or something and, and had somebody turn me away. I've gotten the like, you don't look disabled statement. That one really gets me every time. Um, I've also just had like people who aren't really trained well, who don't understand what they can and can't ask, asking really invasive questions. Um, like obviously it's fine to ask what he does. It's not so fine to say what's wrong with you. Yeah, nope, not okay. <laughs> not super thrilling. Um, but the only two I, I would say like sort of serious incidents I have had is uh, I booked an Airbnb that was not pet friendly. I notified them six weeks in advance I'd be coming with the service dog and this person was just not happy that they were required to accommodate us and they uh, left some really public and very disparaging things about me online that I cannot get taken down. Um, so obviously I, I posted a reply and that's all I can do and that was really unfortunate um, and the only other sort of incident I had was uh, an Uber just kind of leave me on the side of the street. Yeah, which is unfortunately something that most people with service dogs have experienced at one time or another. Exactly, um, yeah. And so. it seems like certain places are better or worse than others. Like as I've traveled, he's been to 10 states with me now and I have found like some areas I run into more issues than others. Like I lived in New York City for last year and I actually rarely ran into any problems in New York. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, usually like major cities are not terrible and then yeah. you go to like smaller places and they can be, but I mean, I've also been denied access to a restaurant in Denver. Yes, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I would um, say like 80% of the time though, it's, it's, it's a lack of training. Like yes. you don't know and if you just take a second to explain it to yes. them, then it's usually fine. Yeah, and if you need help uh, f figuring out how to address public access issues, I do have a video of that. I'm gonna link it up here on one of the cards that you can click on, but it'll give you a full rundown on how to best address those issues without escalating them, but mm -hmm. still advocating for your rights. So yeah. if you need that, click on a button <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Being like calm and confident was something I really had to learn with them. Yeah, and it's it's like you, the more you practice it, the better you get at yeah. it. But I know the first time that it happened to me, I was crying in my van for like <laughs> yeah. half an hour because I was like, just it's just not something that you're used to dealing with. Yeah. And now, you know, 13 years into my career with service dogs, it's like, oh yeah, come at me, you know? <laughs> So is there anything that you came across while you were training that you maybe didn't expect or surprised you while you're training your first service dog? Definitely. I knew going into it and you were like, no, of course, that is going to be difficult and it's going to be a lot of work. It was so much more work than I could have expected. It consumed my life. It was, it was everything I did outside of my job was training this dog. So a full-time job that you're doing, plus chronically ill, plus full-time job of raising and training this dog. Yes, yeah, adding the element that like, not only is this a ton of work, but you are also chronically ill and you're often not feeling well. It was a lot, it was a yeah. lot. And I think my life got much harder before it got easier and that harder period can easily last one to two years. And I think that is so important to know going into it. People do warn you, yeah. you never truly can believe it until yeah. you're feeling it. And I think having a an excellent support system became so critical because there's days if you are chronically ill where you can't kill, care for yourself yeah. let alone your dog so you have to know that you've got that support system in place so as far as a support system what does that mean for you did you mean family you mean dog walkers what does that look like it was a lot of things for me so um it, i continue to need a support system because if i get a migraine obviously he still needs to be walked um so i sort of have uh, my dog walker on the speed dial and um we we have a little process where i talk to siri
scary because I can't see when I get my migraines. Um, and she, she has access to my home at all times. Mm -hmm. And she lets herself in and she takes him. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of those important support system things. But family, friends, things like that, like people who can walk your dog for you, people who can help care for you, make sure their needs are met, especially if you're getting a prospect. You don't just have a dog, you have a puppy. Like, yeah, you know, well, frequently they need stimulation in the middle of the night, in the middle of the night and it doesn't matter how you feel. Yeah. Yep. And that's, that's the hard thing about raising another little being, especially if you're living alone too. Yes. I mean, that's really difficult. It's really challenging. And so, yeah, I, I think that's something that you really shouldn't underestimate is not only the support system you need, but also what that costs to have, that, you know what I mean? Like it's expensive. You, you need a trainer, you had a scent trainer as well as yes. a service dog trainer. Yeah. And then you also need dog walkers, potentially, you know, um, you know, day training for some people yes. so that some the dog can get trained while you're not feeling well. Yep. Um, you know, all of those things are, and, and lots of money on like enrichment activities so that when you're not feeling well, you can be like, here's a lick mat, here's a marrow bone, like yeah. here's stuff for you to do. Yeah, no, honestly, and I had a, a hospital admission <laughs> at one point where I remember becoming so expensive because he wasn't a service dog yet. He was still in training. So he couldn't come in with me. I was in the hospital and um, I, I ended up putting him in a day program mm -hmm. for five days, which was very expensive, and then needed people to watch him at night, to transport him to and from the day program, make sure all of his needs were met, that he wasn't like broken up about, you know, me being missing. And yeah. it was, I remember it being like financially and emotionally a lot at the yeah. time. And it was something I hadn't really thought about going yeah. into it, is what if you go into the hospital before he's a service dog? Yeah, yeah, and especially depending on the different laws, like in Connecticut, where we live, mm -hmm. the service dog in training laws are very different from the ADA laws, which cover fully trained service exactly. dogs. Exactly. So yeah, keeping those things in mind when you're budgeting, not only for a well-bred dog, which is expensive all on its own, yeah. and then all of the support that you need for training and also for being able to manage a dog when you're chronically ill. Right, of course. So as we kind of wind down this portion, we are going to talk over on Patreon about the actual steps and process that you use to get the alert that you were looking for. Um, but while you were training him, like what advice do you have for first time service dog trainers or first time migraine alert or response dog trainers? I think getting the right dog is crucial. Like I mentioned before, I think if I was just kind of let off to make that decision without any advice, I probably wouldn't have made the right choice just because there's a lot of breeds that I just like, like either because of the way they or the way they act so that they're great dog breeds for many other reasons but not for this and I think finding the right prospect was so crucial for me so I interviewed a lot of breeders and I asked them a lot of really pointed questions like just making sure that that dog was absolutely the right choice for me he's, he's over there chewing chewing on a trachea he's <laughs> thrilled <laughs> This is what happens when you have like a <laughs> sub two year old dog. <laughs> um, but I remember like I was interviewing with one of these breeders and I had this moment of ah, this is the dog for me. So many of these breeders were like, oh yeah, my dog will just run for miles and it'll do this and it'll do that. And I remember asking this one breeder like, okay, if I had to do this, like can he do that? And the breeders just kind of went, I don't know that they have the stamina for that. And I went, that's it. That's yes. the dog. I am looking for a low energy animal because yeah. most of service dog work is lay there and do nothing. It's do nothing. Yeah. And, and doing nothing is so much harder sometimes. Yeah. Especially like if you if you get migraines, you know that you're out of commission for many hours. Yeah. And I needed a dog that could just lay there and like take a nap with me and sometimes it's gonna be six hours. Yeah. And knowing that he's kind of lazy enough to handle it but has just enough work drive to do what I need him to do in public was crucial. Um, and then you were mentioning something before we started about intelligent disobedience stuff. I was, yes. So I, there was a lot of learning I had to do. So I remember earlier on, obviously you're, you're constantly teaching your dog to listen to you regardless of what's going on around them. And once he started um, actually responding to my son, I had to start learning that sometimes I need to listen to him. And like, if I have him in a down stay at a restaurant, for example, and he keeps getting up and I keep saying, no, no, down. Um, over time, I realized him ignoring me was actually like an informed disobedience. He was saying, no, I need to tell you something. And I had to learn to listen to him. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's something critical for people to know because the idea of intelligent disobedience, or I call it superseding cues, because you're talking about like you've asked to do a thing, 
Um, but there's this other thing happening in the environment that the dog is like, wait, 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 I've been trained that this thing is the most important thing that's yes. happening right now. Yeah. So making sure that you're not like you're checking, making sure that the dog is alerting for something and then being like, oh, thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, dog. <laughs> yeah. And I think that actually, I hadn't thought of this before, but it stresses the value of like placing a lot of, of reward on that alert. Like if mm -hmm. that is the most important thing when you're training it, you have to reward it so highly. And that is what we did. And I've had a lot of people be like, oh, is, is your dog like really anxious when he alerts you? Like, does he seem concerned? No, he's thrilled. Yeah. Like it's the best thing that could happen to his day is me about to get a migraine because he's like, I am about to get the best reward. Yeah. Um, so it's good because yeah. he's really motivated. Yeah, and that's important to note too is you train him with positive reinforcement, you're using lots of high value rewards and <laughs> yeah. figuring out what, I know he was like a little mediocre on food, but okay, figuring yeah. out like what was really valuable to him yes. was critical in, in getting the alert that you were looking for. Yeah, I definitely had to up the ante a little bit on the value of treats yeah. to make sure he was motivated. Yeah. Um, and that, that was everything. Well, that was a lot of awesome information and I so appreciate you coming because I really wanted to be able to share your story for owner trainers out there because you are the perfect example for with someone who knew what they needed, they got the help that they needed, and then you really put the pieces together and put the team together that you needed to accomplish what you needed with Archie. And and I, I it's just an awesome story. And I like when I look at you guys as a team, I'm just like so proud of all that you've accomplished. I mean really, it's yeah. so amazing. So thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate of it. Of course. And thank you so much for working with us because honestly it really was life changing for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alright, so like I said, we're gonna head over to Patreon or uh, it's patreon.com slash doggy I'll put a link down at the bottom and we're gonna talk a little bit more about the actual process of doing the alert and how I went about doing that. Mm -hmm. So so thank you all for watching. Uh, if you like this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And if you have questions, put them down in the comments below. I'll definitely be checking those. If you like videos like this, make sure you put that in the comments as well. And you all have an awesome day and happy training.